giving lecture on frozen ground. There are places on Earth where uh, ground stays frozen for longer than just winter because, for example, in Europe, during winter, ground also freezes. But there are different places where this frozen ground can stay in this frozen state for longer. So not just winter, but also during next summer. And this lesson will be about those places and connected uh, processes to, uh, free, uh, to frozen ground. I'll start with short uh, definition of uh, frozen ground, so permafrost. Uh, then I'll show you where it exists. Then I'll show terrain features uh, in areas where uh, permafrost occurs. So let me start with the shortest definition. Permafrost, it's permanent and frozen. So the frozen ground that has a temperature lower than zero centigrade continuously for at least uh, two consecutive years. So we can say there is permafrost in the ground where uh, the uh, temperatures below zero stayed in this ground uh, from the last winter through the summer till, la uh, till next winter. So in those places we have permafrost occurrence. Uh, and those places are found in cold climates. And for example, in high latitudes, then we say uh, Arctic uh, permafrost, or high altitudes, that's alpine uh, permafrost, so in high mountains. In those places, ground does not thaw completely even in summer. Thawing is the uh, same process as melting for water but thawing happens to the ground. So it means the change of, uh, of the temperature in the ground from below zero to up to zero, uh, to, to higher than zero degrees. Uh, this definition of permafrost is based entirely on temperature and is independent of the water and ice content of the soil and rock. Actually, glaciers are also frozen rocks or just uh, rock, a uh, solid face of water, but uh, you shouldn't, there is a, different, a difference between uh, landforms connected to glaciers. So glaciers and landforms around those glaciers are in periglacial zones, so in surroundings of glaciers, and these are connected to permafrost. Glaciers are different forms. So Freezing increases uh, soil strength. This is important for different constructions. Uh, so processes involved in frozen ground are really important for engineers that deal with structures as building roads or pipelines. Freezing water becomes a bonding agent, making ground impermeable for liquid water and also different gases such as, uh, for example, methane. So methane and liquid water, if the ground is frozen, they cannot go through the ground. Uh, why it's important to study permafrost uh, and those changes of, of, the, uh, of the temperatures in the ground? These changes of the ground temperatures are indicators of climate change and their changes have impact on groundwater flow, on hydrological cycles, on different periglacial processes and uh, landforms, uh, and they are imp also important for vegetation and fauna, and all linkages in those systems. Uh, some of landforms can be used for reconstructing former climates, so permafrost landforms, can tell us something what was the climate in previous era, for example, during last glaciation in Europe. Um, in constructions and engineering, I mentioned before that uh, frozen ground is important for all the structures. Uh, then we have to ask ourselves, what can influence the temperatures of the ground? Of course, the most important is air temperature, uh, the thermal and humidity properties of the soil, 
solar energy that changes with the height of the sun over the horizon. And what is also important, the depth of permafrost. The amount of incoming energy is conditioned by changes in cloud cover. So when there is direct solar radiation, it warms the ground. But uh, if there are changes in cloud cover, atmospheric precipitation and different exposure, this also influences the ground temperatures. The thickness and duration of snow cover and vegetation can isolate the ground from different changes of uh, air temperature. So, for example, if there is high drop of temperature uh, and the ground is covered with snow cover or vegetation, uh, this temperature won't drop as fast as, with, uh, as uh, air temperature. In ground, it uh, happens slower. Uh, permafrost systems are pretty complex. Uh, there are different processes between atmosphere, hydrosphere, and land. I mentioned about solar radiation, but there are also connections uh, between uh, thermal and fluvial erosion, uh, also influence of uh, uh, seawater for coastal erosion, and there are different, uh, different landforms connected in these areas with occurrence of permafrost. So there are different freeze and thaw cycles. During winter, the ground freezes. During summer, when uh, the sun radiation comes into these areas in high uh, latitudes, uh, we see different processes of freezing and thawing. And all those processes are connected with landforms that will be presented. Uh, but we should... Uh, Remember about the periglacial zone that was introduced by Polish geologist Valery Wozinski in the context of the mechanical disintegration of sandstones by the previous action of intense frost that characterized the mountain summits of southern Carpathians. Uh, in these mountains, you can see those huge uh, rock uh, blocks of uh, rocks uh, and Valery Wozinski uh, knew that these uh, forms, these rock blocks, were formed by different processes of freezing and thawing. And this freezing and thawing wasn't happening uh, when he was there, but he knew that it was referred to climatic and geomorphic conditions of the periphery of Pleistocene ice sheets and glaciers. So not recently, but from two and a half million years to about, uh, to about 12,000 years before present. Uh, these environments, periglacial environments, experience mean annual air temperatures of less than, uh, than uh, plus three degrees. So it means that during winter is lower than zero degrees, and during summer, it's usually not higher than around 3 or 5 centigrade. Um, and the lower the temperatures, the different processes that uh, happen to those areas. So uh, especially changes between freezing and thawing in these uh, areas influence how they look. Uh, most of present-day permafrost, so the frozen ground, formed during... Uh, or since the last ice age. So when the uh, ice sheets retreated from Europe some 20, 12,000 years ago, um, they just revealed the ground that was un uh, under those glaciers, under those ice sheets. And this ground, when it was exposed, uh, exposed to, uh, to air temperatures, started to freeze. Because before, these were uh, these grounds were isolated by ice sheets or glaciers. So we can imagine some 15,000 years ago there were huge ice sheets and huge mountain glaciers around the world. Recently we observe deglaciation, so the areas of uh, there is disappearance of huge ice sheets and also there is retreat of glaciers. But still, occurrence of permafrost is 
around 20% of the total land area. Uh, so permafrost uh, is present in northern Siberia, for example. So most of Russia, uh, there is frozen ground. Northern Canada, and also in different places in high mountains. So for example, in Himalayas, uh, in the Alps, in Cordilleras, and also in the surrounding of, uh, of Antarctic ice sheet, so also in the Antarctic. And depending on, on the latitude and altitude, there is continuous permafrost, discontinuous permafrost, sporadic permafrost, and different isolated patches, and also subsea permafrost. Subsea permafrost is also from previous era, when the temperatures were much lower, so uh, the the temperatures, uh, air temperatures, influence the temperatures of the ground, and this ground stayed frozen since that time. The continuous permafrost is in uh, higher latitudes, and the higher the latitude and altitude, you can see continuous permafrost or discontinuous. That means that in some places there is permafrost, and in some there is not. So the ground thaws completely uh, during summer and it doesn't stay frozen. That's an example of a high latitude, Svalbard archipelago, 78 degrees north. There we have continuous permafrost. In Scandinavian mountains, 65 degrees north, there is also permafrost which is continuous in higher parts of the mountains and in lower parts is discontinuous. But there's also permafrost in the Alps, so 46 degrees north. And there are also patches of permafrost in Pyrenees, in Spain, 42 degrees north. And I mentioned about uh, Subsea permafrost, uh, it's shown here as the blue line around the, uh, actually on the bottom of Arctic Ocean. It underlies the shelves of the Eurasia and North American continents, and it's uh, relict or in equilibrium with the present climate. But I mentioned that during, uh, f uh, during winter, the ground freezes, but during summer, it can happen that upper part of the ground, so just right below the surface, it thaws. So underneath, it's, uh, it remains frozen because the temperatures during winter were so cold that summer temperatures won't thaw the whole part of the ground. So the thin layer of soil that forms on top of permafrost is called active layer. It freezes again, of course, during winter and thaws during summer. In different areas, for example, in northern Canada, this active layer is thin. It's only 10 centimeters. But in areas with warmer summers, uh, summers for example, in Yakutsk in Russia, this active layer is thicker. It can reach up to two and a, uh, two and a half meters. In areas of discontinuous permafrost, the active layer can be also very thick, around five meters, such as, uh, such as in uh, Yellowknife in Canada. So there is permafrost underneath, but the upper part thaws and freezes again, and it thaws out up to five meters during summer. Here you can see it um, in this graph. It shows the active layer. The thickness of permafrost, which is under the active layer. And uh, to the right, you, it can be uh, explained also in uh, that the north is on the right side, so the thicker permafrost because of lower temperatures, and thinner permafrost, but thicker active layer to the left, so further, uh, further south in the northern hemisphere. Uh, scientists such as myself are interested in uh, ground temperatures because I mentioned these are important for hydrological cycles. That's why we drill boreholes using, for example, this drilling rig. So you can see that this equipment 
drills the hole and in this hole we put sensors and loggers these sensor me uh, sensors measure the temperatures of the ground so we get the data for uh, yeah for longer periods uh, if we monitor the ground temperatures these sensors can stay for many years so uh, they give us information about the state of the ground thermal state of the ground and for example uh, this graph shows the thermal state in Hornsund that's Polish Polar Station in Spitsbergen uh, and on x-axis you see years uh, the y-axis shows depth and there are different temperatures measured so up to 20 meters you can see that these are uh, temperatures during winter and during summer the more uh, reddish or yellow uh, temperatures are above zero degrees uh, so we can see it used to be much colder during winter and recently we observed that during summer it's warmer and warmer and it influences the thermal state of the ground and it happens all around the world not only in Hornsund so from different stations where there are measurements of the thermal state of the ground you can get uh, such graphs uh, as shown here it's the temperature trumpet curve and this curve uh, shows the changes of temperatures so the higher uh, the closer to the surface the ground temp uh, temperatures have higher fluctuations they just change with the air temperature as you can see here and with growing depth the deeper it is those uh, fluctuations are lower so uh, just close to the surface you can see that during summer the ground temperature can reach around five degrees as here and during winter the ground can freeze so it freezes up to uh, let's say 10 minus 10 degrees and these changes happen just to this this shallow depth and this part shows the active layer if the temperature is lower than zero we say that here starts the table of permafrost so below this depth below the active layer there is permafrost uh, yeah so if you have measurements from uh, different depths you can see uh, what are the fluctuations during the uh, whole season in different depths in the ground and for example from Hornsen station there is this uh, temperature curve temperature trumpet curve uh, that shows the changes of the temperature from plus 10 degrees to minus 20 degrees actually in 20 uh, 25 years so from 1990 to 2014 as written and you can see those fluctuations are higher closer to the surface and lower with the depth so the deeper it is the fluctuations are lower and the heat from underneath from uh, the heat uh, from the earth uh, provides higher temperatures than uh, the changes from the air temperatures so the thickness of the permafrost in horizon is around 100 meters I mentioned about different processes connected uh, with periglacial zones uh, those are uh, frost weathering so freeze thaw cycles there is this process of freezing of water that changes into ice and its volume increases by nine percent so if there are specific circumstances this expansion of water is able to displace or fracture rocks even huge rocks uh, there is also chemical weathering so the growth of salt crystals if the water that contains uh, different salt it, it can also get into the cracks and also break them down so th that's chemical weathering when different salt crystals can grow 
or uh, yeah, melt and go down with water and then freeze again, that, there is a process of chemical weathering. There is also downslope mass movement. This can be frost creep if the surface creeps, soliflaction if the ground is not frozen, uh, the soliflaction can occur during uh, summer, but I will show you pictures with examples. And galliflaction if the ground is frozen, but also moves down with the gravity. There are also other processes as nivation, ice patches that uh, appear there during winter, uh, and the snow results in localized weathering and erosion by freeze and thaw. And this can lead to small depressions. So there are these innovation hollows in places where the snow uh, was present and then melted. These can also uh, be seen in the, on the ground. There are also different fluvial processes when frozen sediments uh, are removed by, by riverbank erosion by uh, different rivers. And there are also pro uh, eolian processes, so those connected with wind action. Strong winds create deflation surfaces. So winds in per, uh, periglacial areas, there, usually there's no vegetation. So the strong winds just move uh, the sediments through the ground and they also influence the vegetation and soil and uh, fine materials that can be removed. Uh, what are the consequences, consequences of climate warming uh, on permafrost? So what we observed recently is increasing of permafrost temperature. I showed you those temperatures, the, those different changes uh, of ground temperatures, these temperature trumpet. Recently we observed higher temperatures on different depths. So we go lower, it used to be colder, now it's higher temperature, although it stays below zero. So there is permafrost, but with higher temperature, still below zero. Uh, we also observe increase of magnitude and rate of development of the active layer. So the active layer is thicker and thicker. So the ground thaws deeper and deeper. There is development of different periglacial processes and landforms. And uh, this degradation of permafrost influences biogeochemical reactions and the basic geotechnical properties of the ground. I'll show you pictures soon. So when the permafrost thaws, you can see, for example, it happens in Siberia. There is a huge hole in the ground because the permafrost thawed and collapsed. And the water was just uh, went somewhere through. It's really important uh, to, that permafrost uh, contains lots of carbon and also other greenhouse gases such as methane. For example, global carbon storage in uh, different soils is shown here on the chart. As you can see, the amount of uh, this carbon stored in permafrost soils is uh, more than one and a half thousand gigatons. Uh, and these uh, greenhouse gases can be released if the permafrost will thaw. And those greenhouse gases, greenhouse gas is, the, uh, is in the atmosphere, uh, uh, that's the gas that absorbs and emits radiation within the thermal infrared range that has a global warming potential. In this chart, you can see the greenhouse effect. So the direct solar radiation that goes to the ground, it can be also reflected from the ground and then reflected back from the atmosphere. So the more greenhouse gases uh, are in the atmosphere, the more solar rad radiation and heat will stay in the atmosphere. So greenhouse gases have effects and global warming potential. Uh, and those greenhouse gases such as water vapor, which is the largest component of the greenhouse effect, up to 72%, 
but there's also car carbon dioxide from 9 to 26 percent uh, and methane from around 4 to 9 uh, percent and if those two carbon dioxide and methane that are uh, frozen in the ground in the soil will be released they will have huge effect on global warming let me switch, switch uh, now to periglacial landforms and these are different block fields scree and talus on slopes rock glaciers galliflaction lobes soliflaction lobes nivation hollows flattened summit, different pingos, thermocarst, so thermocarst appear when uh, the ice that is in the ground, in the frozen ground, is melting, so different lakes can appear. And other landforms are connected uh, with the surroundings of glaciers, such as sanders. There are also ice wedge polygons, and pulsas, so frost push on peats. Uh, those patterned ground uh, examples, ice wedge polygons, as mentioned before, uh, appear because the repeated freezing and thawing of the active layer produce those interesting patterns on the ground, and these are called ice wedge polygons. And they have different types. This can be uh, circles, nets, different polygons and stripes. Uh, they appear because there is process that happens to the ground, the cracking of the ground and contract of the ground. For example, if we we'll, uh, go to the field during winter, when the temperature drops suddenly from around minus 5 to let's say minus 20, the water that, that is uh, in the ground freezes and extends. And this expand of water happens and cracks the ground. So in these places, ice wedge uh, polygons appear. During summer, you can see the picture on the left, how, how this wedge can look. But if this process of freezing uh, that happens during winter and then it's uh, thawing during summer, so ice stays uh, underneath uh, the surface of the ground. But this crack is the weakest point of the ground and will appear next winter. So th this ground will crack again next year. And during summer there will be melting and a thawing of the ground. And with this melt the water can seep through the ground and as you can see there is an example on the right side there is a picture of ice wedge this is how ice wedges look underneath the ground and on the surface they are visible as patterned ground such as here but there are also other examples here these circles or such stripes in these places where the ground was cracking the water was uh, during summer was flowing through and was just pushing all the materials and the materials were also pushed up and you can see all these rocks on the patterned ground and such patterned ground is also uh, happened before uh, during the last ice age and after that and there are examples for example in Poland of such patterned ground uh, Recently, you can just see them from above, and that's an example from Bielsk Podlaski. There are different block fields and talus slopes, uh, which are the surface uh, co covered by boulder or block sized angular rocks. I told you about this uh, physical weathering, so cracking of, of, ice blo of, of blocks of rock because of ice that was between uh, the uh, rocks. So we can see them here. On the upper parts it's block fields and on the lower parts uh, on the slopes there are those talus slopes. And so after cracking of the rock they just failure, uh, they fall down uh, uh, with the gravitation 
along the slope. And what, what is the effect on slope stability? Over the past century, we observed increasing number of alpine rock uh, slope failures events in different mountain ranges around the world. So as you can see, the changes of permafrost, if there is more and more thawing, uh, there is also difference in weathering. So there is more uh, failures of rocks from the different mountains. And other example of uh, creeping of the soil when it thaws is active layer detachment. On the slope, the active layer, when it appears, when it thaws, it can, uh, with the gravity, go down. And such example can be seen here, active layer de detachment. So the ground that detached from itself and just went down. On different mountains, for example, in Spitsbergen, you can see different processes on the slopes and also uh, flattening of the upper parts of the mountains. Yeah, so these are examples of talus slopes. And in the surrounding of glaciers, we have different landforms uh, connected with glaciers, but glacier, uh, glaciers recently retreat and the lower, the, the freezing can appear in the ground that was previously underneath the glacier, which could be not frozen. But recently, low temperatures influence the ground that stays frozen uh, in the next years. And uh, recently, there are processes that are connected with freezing and thawing and not exactly connected with uh, glaciers, but connected with their retreat. So, for example, we can see that th there was a glacier before, but it was covered by different avalanches, different rocks. So, underneath the uh, glacier ice uh, is still visible, but due to different uh, periglacial processes, it can be uncovered, it can uh, freeze uh, or thaw again. Uh, or, or, yeah, ice will melt, actually, but all the ground that is there will thaw. And you can see here the failure on the slope. There are also rock glaciers. Here is an example of rock glacier in Iceland. And these great glaciers, rock glacier, are glaciers are also indicators of permafrost and periglacial conditions. Uh, they are generated in diff different cold climates but it uh, remains unclear if rock glacier represent a distinctive periglacial landform or they are end members of a geomorphic continuum of the ice glaciers and rock fall talus slopes. So here you can see the glaciers that, were mo that moved back, retreated, so only on upper parts of this valley you can see still some glacier ice, but below there are rock glaciers and how they uh, how these are formed they form in different ways but for example they are uh, produced by avalanches so seasonal accumulation of avalanche snow and rock debris in the runout zones it can be one to five meters if this meltwater during uh, summer from, from the avalanches, during summer this meltwater will percolate to the lower part of the snowpack. It can also refreeze if it meets the frozen ground. And they form basal ice layer. And above there is this protective surface layer of rock debris. And it is formed on the remaining avalanche snow as the surface snow ablates. So here is a graph showing this displacement of active layer and permafrost that is caused by avalanche debris accumulation. So there are rocks, there are avalanches that come. These avalanches, the, the, they melt during summer, but refreeze when they meet frozen ground. And they grow, 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 and even uh, such landforms as uh, rock glaciers can appear. So there will be movement of the ice underneath and movement of these rocks inside the avalanches and inside the uh, glacier, uh, rock glacier. 
As you can see, this can be talus derived rock glaciers if the talus, the, the materials will cover the glacier and also uh, on, uh, by the avalanches. Other form, uh, forms connected with periglacial processes are soliflexion lobes. If the ground un uh, is thawing during summer, the uh, ground can creep slowly and you can see on the ground lobes such as this one here. Uh, I mentioned about riverbank erosion. If there is frozen ground uh, beneath the surface, but it meets the water uh, from river, so there is this process of erosion by river to frozen ground. So you can see blocks of ground that used to be frozen, but now they are released by river erosion. There is also other landform called pingo that has conical or elongated uh, shape. It, it's a hill, actually. Uh, it can also have dome-shaped mount and co consists of layer of soil that covers a large core of ice. This is example of pingo. And pingo is formed under hydrostatic pressure. And on this uh, graph, you can see the formation of different kind of pingos, of pingos of open and closed system. So if the ground is frozen, but underneath the permafrost, there is sub-permafrost groundwater flow. This flow will appear on the surface, uh, but it, this water can freeze again, and there will be this injection of ice, so ice lands will, uh, will appear underneath the ground. So it will push up the materials and such pushed material can be seen as, as pingo. Uh, I told you before about these engineering problems, uh, about different structures uh, uh, connected uh, with frozen ground. All constructions in periglacial areas are set on the piles. So engineers have to drill the boreholes and put the piles to the frozen ground because frozen ground won't move. But if it will thaw, it will move and will shake all the structures. That's why uh, recently uh, most structures in the Arctic have to be, uh, have to be drilled deeper. All the, con uh, uh, yeah, the, the constructions are put on uh, piles, and that's an example of pile driver. These put those piles into the ground, into the boreholes, and then all the buildings are set on such piles. Just to not uh, give the heat from above to the ground, those piles uh, prevent uh, those heating from the buildings that would uh, thaw the ground. So there is, uh, the, the wind can blow through so the air temperature will freeze again and uh, the active layer under such buildings won't grow higher and higher, but actually it happens. If this heat uh, is uh, transported to the ground, you can see all the structures can collapse. And these are examples if the uh, active layer is thicker, those piles start to move. They are not solid in the frozen ground, but move and uh, yeah, influence the infrastructure that is on top of permafrost. Here is example on cracks on the wall of the building. And here, uh, here is how the uh, Trans-Alaska pipeline looks. It's uh, set above the ground just to avoid the sowing of the ground. So it's isolated uh, from, from the ground. And this has to be done everywhere. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. You can ask in the chat box.